Last week in our video series, Prayerful Traditions, we looked at the use of the Anglican Rosary and how it helps us by using our sense of touch to ground us as we pray to God. Now today, as we, as we go along looking at other traditions, we are going to go from touch to sight as we glance at icons. Now, icons are very specialized paintings that have been carefully created specifically as an extension of prayer and as a medium of prayer. They are themselves the result of an iconographer who is actually painting out their prayer, painting out their meditation. And as a result of that, there are no random, unintended elements to this work. Every brushstroke has meaning. Every part of the design, from the look of the subject to the color to the point of horizon, is completely used to add and tell a story. Now, these holy paintings have been used by the church since the 4th century, and to give a complete overview would take far longer than we have here today. So at the bottom of this post, in the descriptions, I will list a couple of books that have been helpful to me. Instead of looking at the full history, what we are going to do is look at a few icons we have at Christ our Redeemer, and then at the elements that each of them contain, and how to actually use these windows of heaven, as they are referred to, to help us meditate on the infinite God we serve. Now, unlike the Book of Common Prayer and the Rosary, using the icon creates and fosters our need to be still in the presence of God, and to ultimately to be spoken to. So the largest part of using an icon isn't in the verbal prayer itself, but instead in the act of quieting ourselves and focusing on God. And this brings us to the first major thing with icons. They are to be seen as doorways and as windows into a heavenly reality. It is a here and now type thing. So when we look at an icon of well Pentecost or of the three visitors at Abraham's house, which we'll look at in a minute, we don't just think of the event, but of what this means to us now and how it affects us, as well as what it means to us in the future and how it will affect. So looking at a few of these icons, let's see what they say about what God has done and then see what God is doing. Now, the first icon we're going to look at is the Good Shepherd. Now, this is one of my favorite icons. I've been using this since seminary and the endless amounts of lessons and meditations the Lord has given me have just been amazing and I have been grateful for them all. But as we're looking at this icon, the things that we notice first is, well, of course, it's, it's about Jesus. Now, how do we know this is Jesus if we were just looking at it? The first and easiest are the marks in his hands. Now, if you, you Google um, or if you buy a Good Shepherd icon, uh, many of them don't have the nail marks in the hands. I'm not sure why. I just I think that's very powerful in this one. It's what makes this specific one so, uh, so amazing to me. The other is, you may think, oh, well, he has a beard and a halo. Well, no, actually, the earlier icons show Jesus clean-shaven. Um, and he looks a little more Roman. Uh, this is a, a Russian or an Orthodox um, icon, so uh, he has a, a full beard, but it's actually in his clothing. Uh, you're saying, well, that seems odd, but in most of the paintings that Christ is depicted at, especially ones that are focused on his sacrifice, you're going to notice that it is red and blue. And the reason it's red and blue is because it shows his humanity, the red, and his divinity, the blue. Um, so each, each part of that is something intentional. We're going to be looking at the Holy Trinity, and though the copy of it I have is kind of faded out, you're going to see that there, there is red and blue um, within, the, uh, within the painting. Now, how do you pray with this? How do you focus? Well, the first thing is, well, of course, be still. Look at the icon and let every element of it just have its own weight. And then trust in the Holy Spirit to guide you into what, what He has for you at that moment. It will be different from time to time. It will change. One day it may be on the physical aspect of the icon itself. So when you approach it, like today, if that were what the Holy Spirit had, 
It may be that you're looking at the wood that makes up the icon. And, and then you notice that it's red, and you think of the sacrifice of Jesus as he went to rescue that lamb. It took the cross to, to free that lamb. Maybe it's the nails in the hands, or the hands themselves. Look at how, how unusual they look. Like the hands them, themselves uh, are rounded at the bottom. Well, that's not to be goofy. That's to actually show the strength in the hand. It represents strong muscles. And so Jesus is holding on to that lamb for, for life. That lamb, look at it. Does that look like a happy lamb to you? No, that is a very tired lamb. That is a very worn out lamb. And it is draped over Jesus' shoulders without the possibility of escaping. And then you see that weird muscle in Jesus' neck. And uh, once again, it isn't, to, it isn't just a stylistic weird element. It's a beautiful element that they're showing the strength of the muscle. And so Jesus has muscles that are strong enough to carry that lamb that he's rescued. And so all of these things can, can be added in. Maybe the Holy Spirit does draw you to the lamb. And so as you look at the lamb's face, you think of your own plight, how many times you have been tired. But then it draws you to God, that God is actively carrying you right now, that God is act actively holding you, that it's through the cross that you have been saved. Now, could be the mix of divinity and humanity in Christ. Whatever it is, maybe the shepherd's staff, and you think of Psalm 23, think of the times God has led you to green pastures, whatever the element is, spend about five minutes thinking about it. Five minutes. Just set an alarm. Uh, that may seem sacrilegious, but God doesn't care. He loves the fact that his children are just with him. And just allow the Holy Spirit to speak. Now, as you do this, start thinking about what is being said. Because at the end of it, a good practice is to then verbalize your thanksgiving to God for, for what he has given to you. But only after receiving, only after hearing. So that is this first icon. And there are a million other things that could be said. Uh, there are entire books written about this specific one. But just let this be a, a framework. Come to the icon, let it speak to you. And let it teach you what is what's the reality in heaven behind it, and then praise God for it. Now, the second icon we're going to be looking at is Rublev's Holy Trinity. Now, unlike the first icon we looked at, this is an Old Testament story. This is an Old Testament picture. So, when we look at this, what we're looking at at first glance is the story of Abraham having the three visitors, being told that Sarah is going to be pregnant, and that Sodom and Gomorrah is destroyed. And so the elements of that story are all present. Um, you'll see the house above the far left figure in the picture, um, right above his head. You'll see the Okamamre just off to the right of the central figure. They're all sit seated at the table. Uh, in the middle is the, is the chalice for the drink. And then <laughs> there is an empty space. And the empty space is there for Abraham to, to be walking into communion as they tell, tell him what God's about to do uh, to Sodom and Gomorrah. So that is the Old Testament story. But that's not the full meaning of the icon. In fact, it's not even the most important part of the icon. The icon itself is taking this story and instead translating it to the heavenly reality of the Trinity. If we look at this, what we see is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all gathered together in communion at the table. The two right figures are staring at the left figure. Now, I have to say this now because there are some people that are going to be really uh, uneasy uh, about any type of depiction of the Father. And that is actually the rule with icons is not to depict the Father. But because this is a shadow in the Old Testament of a future reality, that is the only way that this can happen. We no, do not have icons of the Father because the only way we know the Father is through the Son. 
So if that was a, a, a problem, then that is the explanation. But the sun is the central figure. Now, like we said before, you can tell that because even though he has a clean shaven face, look at the clothing. He is uh, in red and in blue, and even though that's kind of faded um, or darkened, then you can still tell that that's what's going on. The Holy Spirit is in blue and white, and both are looking at the Father. And if you are into art, you'll notice that this creates a circle. Their feet are are facing each other, the heads are facing, and it creates this beautiful circle, uh, complete and holy. And so that is the, that's that part of the story, the Trinity. But just as the visitors invite Abraham in to learn the story, the main part of this, this icon is that they're allowing us to walk into, into their communion. The, the chalice is set for us to be able to take, for us to be able to look at, um, and it is an empty spot at the table. And isn't that a heavenly reality that, that we can meditate on? It's absolutely beautiful. So how I have used this in the past, what I would say to, to do is once again, just let these things flow over you. Now I have a story with this icon. Um, it is obviously not professionally made. Uh, it is a little bit dingy. It's old and falling apart. But I was given this icon by a dear friend and a mentor in seminary. And he had just taken a bulletin. He loved this. He saw it. He took a bulletin. He put it on a piece of wood and shellacked it. Now, every time I think of this, I think of all the lessons I learned from Father Harry. And that is definitely what you're supposed to do with icons. There's several that have been damaged through the years. And actually, the damage that was done to these icons, uh, the burn holes or the tears, are a, just as much a part of what the Holy Spirit can lead you into as the original painting. So use all of these elements to let it speak to you. Now, recently, um, ser well, several years ago, one of the elements that really spoke to me clearly that I'd point out, um, and this is just me, is the chalice. Well, I always thought of the chalice as being this, this moment of joy and of, of being filled with love and mercy. And as I went through Lent, I looked at that chalice and I was thinking, the chalice is the chalice that, that Christ took. When he said, Father, let this cup pass. And in the end he said, but thy will be done. And so as I meditated on that, I thought of, they're inviting me into, into the divine suffering. I am being invited into taking the chalice of suffering so that I can pour myself out, be a vessel for others to see the mercy and the love of God. So that's just, that's just one thing. There are so many things to think about with the Old Testament story, with the New Testament reality. And once again, I would just encourage you to just center yourselves and spend five minutes looking at some moment. Let the Holy Spirit wash over you and then respond to that in praise and adoration. Now the next pat or the next icon we're going to be looking at is is a little bit different and might not even be considered a, a, a standard icon, but it's one that God has definitely definitely spoken to me through. But it is going to be the San Damiano cross. This final icon that we're going to be looking at, this final uh, piece, is the San Damiano cross. Now. This cross is important to church history because it was the cross that St. Francis looked at and Christ called him to do his, his reforming work that really, really saved the church. Um, this painting, this uh, picture is very, very involved. Uh, it is not standard because once again, it's a cross, but like an icon or a traditional icon, it has the elements uh, that you can use to meditate on. Um, you might look at the, uh, the gold shining and it shows us the divinity and the glory of God. It could be the look of Christ looking up to the Father. The, the hair, which uh, resembles a bishop's miter coming down over Christ's shoulders. 
Um, if I can do this without making you all sick with movement, look at Christ's hands. In Christ's hands, you see blood. And as the blood pours down, and you can barely see it, the blood pours down and it provides a curtain over these central characters. The central ones are, of course, Mary and John. And it's, it's pouring this beautiful, beautiful curtain of salvation to all those around Christ. And then you will see up at the very top, you will see the saints. You'll see the angels receiving Christ in all of his glory. And it reminds us of what we have been given in Christ. So once again, we take a look and we step back and we calm ourselves and we let the Holy Spirit take over and we let the Holy Spirit guide us into the various things that, that he has for us, the things that he wants to show us. And in the end, we are given God's everlasting glory. We're seeing more clearly what God wants us to see, and then we respond. Well, I hope this has been helpful. Like I said, I will in the bottom, we will have a, a list of books. There are also other places you can go. You could type in icons, Greek icons, Good Shepherd, San Damiano Cross. You can Google those things and find those pictures. Um, you can put them on your, your phone as a desktop. That's a wonderful way to have them as you walk around. Um, Catholic uh, bookstores will have them as cards sometimes. There's endless ways to, to get them, but the important thing isn't to have just an authentic one. That, that would be amazing but to have something to be able to quiet ourselves and to know that the Lord is good. So until next week, when we look at um, Lectio Divina and that wonderful form of prayer uh, by using scriptures, um, may God bless you. May your time just be overflowing with his goodness and his mercy. In the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, may his blessing be upon you now and always. Amen.